Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo here with Kim Strassel and Joe Sternberg. Well, what do you know? Sometimes... uh, Truth is stranger than fiction. The president's aides have discovered a second batch of documents, first batch classified documents, this time in a garage at his uh, home in Wilmington, apparently next to his Corvette. You have to wonder what classified documents were doing there. Was he taking them out for a spin? A little roadster uh, trip, go hang out by the ocean and get a little relaxation as you're reading about the Ukrainian war? I don't know. Asked about it. Remember, the first batch came out. It was discovered in a former office that the president had used, and the documents were from when he was vice president president. That was dismissed by people in the White House to say, well, just an accident. We don't know how they got there, but we're looking into it. And we're cooperating fully with the Justice Department and the National Archives. We turned them right away. Now, this second batch suggests that the White House has uh, essentially probably put a full court press on to see where they can find Whatever classified documents they might have, they're probably looking in the closets and probably various basements and envelopes uh, here and there. Don't know what the president did. Asked about it at a a news event where the president was talking about the inflation numbers. He said, my Corvette is in a locked garage. Okay, so it's not like they're sitting out in the street. Let's listen to more of his comments. They discovered a small number of documents of classified markings and storage areas and file cabinets in my home and my, in my, my, my personal library. This was done in the case of the Biden Penn, and th- this was done in the case of the Biden Penn Center. The Department of Justice was immediately, as was done, the Department of Justice was immediately cl- uh, uh, no- notified and uh, the lawyers arranged for the Department of Justice to take possession of the document. Well, Kim, I don't know what you do with your <laughs> classified documents, but they're not in my garage. I keep them in my kids' rooms, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're probably safe there, actually, probably safer than in Joe's garage. What do you think of his explanation? Is this all going to fly? Well, first of all, the explanation was very curious because the rest of the press reports were that they'd been found in his garage. He now enters this suggestion that they were in file cabinets in his personal library, which I don't know if we're meant to take that that means his personal library is in his garage or were there additional ones found in his home? I think it's the latter, it sounds like. Interesting. Okay. You know, it's fascinating. He said this, but overall, it's interesting that the White House and the president's team have been far less forthcoming on this particular finding of documents. And there's probably a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one is in some ways, the optics of this are just a little bit worse than the first batch. I mean, the first batch were pretty bad, especially the fact that it'd been found and that nobody said anything about it for two months and some of the other things around it. But this one's a little harder because, first of all, it's no longer a one-off, right? It's not as if there was some documents found at that UPenn office and it just was a a mistake. Now we've got a second place, which kind of adds to the question of what's going on here. Secondly, one of the big distinctions that everybody had been making between Biden and Trump is, wow, this is different. This was at an, an official office, whereas this was at Trump's home. Well, you know what? Voila, like here we have documents now at Biden's home. And then you add in the fact that they're just sort of sitting in a garage somewhere. I mean, one of the reasons we're talking about all of this is because documents with classified markings are meant to be held in secure facilities. You know, ask any government worker. You're not allowed to just take them home with you at night if you're working on something. Uh, We have these things called skiffs. And so here we have we don't know how many documents hanging out in the president's garage, a second episode, and not a lot of other details. We were talking about this on the handling of documents that are classified question at our meeting today. And Bill McGurn, who worked in the Bush White House as the chief speechwriter, told us that you are really supposed to be very disciplined in how you handle those documents. You can't For example, if you were reading a classified document at your desk, you couldn't just leave that document on your desk if you slip out and go to the restroom. If you were discovered to have done that, you could be fined for mishandling the document. You're supposed to put them in a locked safe while you are away from your desk. John Deutsch, 
former CIA director uh, under Bill Clinton, was sanctioned. After he was CIA director, he was discovered to have had classified documents on a laptop at home. He pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor and was pardoned by President Clinton at the end of his term. So the sanctions on this sort of handling question can be notable. And I just make one other point, Joe Sternberg, which is that the White House has been at pains to try to distinguish itself from Trump by saying, well, we have cooperated with the National Archives and then Justice Department, basically skirting the question of the fundamental problem here, which was mishandling the documents in the first place. Let's forget about that. They said they wanted everybody forget about that mishandling and just say, see, we're, we turned them all over. So nothing to watch here. I don't think that's going to work. I don't either. And I am hoping, and I know this is probably a vain hope, but I'm an optimistic guy anyway. This might trigger some people to start at least talking about the Trump situation in a slightly different way, because you'll have noticed over the years that any time Donald Trump does something that is at all unorthodox, whether it's good or bad, there's this tendency in the part of the media and a lot of his detractors to portray it as a huge threat to democracy. And, you know, again, you saw a lot of hyperventilating in that direction when, when we discovered that there had been some of these documents at Mar-a-Lago. And, you know, there was immediately all of this very dark speculation about what he had been doing with it there and, you know, all of that sort of thing. And now that we're having this reminder that actually this is just the sort of careless, stupid thing that a lot of people who have been in government seem to do, you know, in this kind of situation. And perhaps it's better that we think about these is stupid, careless mistakes that do violate the law and that do demand answers for that reason, but are not necessarily really a threat to the American way of life in the way that we were told had happened after the Mar-a-Lago raid. That's the big lesson that I'm extracting from this, that there's a difference between the careless and the potentially criminal, if you want to talk about the legal rules about classified material, versus the threat to the American way of life. I, I agree with your hope, Joe, but I think you can criticize Trump, and we have for being reckless in how he handled the documents. He created this problem for himself by not cooperating more with the National Archives and getting into this brawl that became ultimately the excuse for this raid on his property and his potential legal peril. But Kim, Merrick Garland, uh, he's going to have a press conference later, a press event later today in which he's presumably going to address this subject. He's got some real difficulties. I mean, he's appointed a special counsel to investigate Trump both on the January 6th question and also on this documents issue. What does he do with Joe Biden? He's got a U.S. attorney from Delaware investigating this. But does he make him a special counsel? I don't like special counsels. I think that Garland should essentially take care of this himself, make the decision himself. He's ultimately responsible. And then the question becomes, how in the world can you indict Donald Trump for mishandling documents based on the evidence that's public so far? And then say, well, sorry, Joe Biden gets off scot-free. I, I just don't see how politically you can pull that off. Paul, I'm struck by the words you used in describing Trump, saying he brought this on himself. I think you can use the exact same words for Merrick Garland. He has very much brought this on himself and on his boss, as it happens in the end. As we at the editorial page have said many times in editorials and on this show, yes, Trump should have handled this better. At the same time, the decision to raid a former president's home was unprecedented, especially over what in essence is a document fight. The decision to then name a special counsel to look into that was also a kind of next level thing. A lot of people arguing that, you know, this is a reversal of what Bill Barr was attempting to do at the Department of Justice, where he was trying to depoliticize the agency. This looked to be a repoliticization of the agency. And now, now you have this problem is that, you know, what is good for the goose has to be good for the gander. I think it's highly possible that he does come out and name another special counsel. Interestingly, Republicans have been pushing him to have Jack Smith, the current Trump special counsel, simply handle this case as well, since the issues are related. That would make the whole political issue even more complex for Smith, because it would even heighten things if he were to indict one of them and not the other. We'll see what he does. I agree with you. I don't like special counsels, but the problem we have here is the Department of Justice. I mean, this is the overall problem. It continues to wade in 
to politics. And then the people who make those decisions try to insulate themselves from the fallout by naming other people to do their work. And I agree with you. What we need is some accountability at the Department of Justice, but also some standards again, and a return to the general guideline that you don't wade into every political problem because it just makes people lose trust in the institution. Yeah, some kind of wrist slap sanction or some kind of settlement in the cases where Trump has got to turn over the documents to the archives and go back to negotiating with the archives if he wants to actually have classified documents, which he has the right to have access to under the Presidential Records Act. He just can't keep them permanently wherever he wants around the Mar-a-Lago household. And of course, President Biden should also have some kind of reckoning here, although, I mean, the idea that either of them would be indicted strikes me as overkill in the extreme. I think we can safely say, though, that a locked garage is not qualify under any notion of a safe space for classified documents, certainly not any garage I've been around. Now, maybe the president's garage is a little more fortified, but I don't think so. It's got a library, Paul. (laughs) <laughs> well, and the, yeah, and the locked Corvette standard, I think, is not also uh, is also not going to qualify. Well, thanks for Kim Strassel and thanks for uh, Joe Sternberg. We appreciate it. Thank you all for listening. We will be back tomorrow, as every day, with another edition of Tomac Watch. Thanks for listening.